All right. Hello, hello. Hi. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Diana Lee, the Associate Director of Education and Training Initiatives here at Columbia Zuckerman Institute. And I would like to welcome all of you here and online to this evening's Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture. And it's our fourth and final one of this year's series. So I wanna take special time, thank you, uh, to thank all of you for joining us tonight and to shout out those of you who've joined us multiple times, if not for all four of them this year, it's really, really great to have this really interested audience joining us. And putting together this lecture series is really exciting for me because um, it allows us to showcase scientists at the top of their field, uh, really pushing research forward. And not only that, but they are addressing issues of societal importance that helps us inform and engage our community. So as we continue our commitment to outst outstanding science and excellent programming, we hope that tonight's lecture will leave you with a better understanding of the science happening in New York City at Columbia's um, Zuckerman Institute and at Barnard College. So in conjunction with this lecture series, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Teacher Scholar Program supports local science teachers who bring lecture content from this series into their classrooms. And we are really thrilled to continue welcoming our teachers back in person attending this lecture series. And of course, I'm so pleased to see so many of you tuning in online as well. And of course, I have to thank the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation for their generosity, and as well as the foundation members who join us here tonight for all of their continued partnership and their commitment to making brain science accessible to all. We couldn't do it without them. So tonight's topic is something that I think might resonate for, uh, with all of us for maybe funny reasons, because it's all about uncertainty. And I know that might not sound super inviting, but I'm hoping our experts tonight will show us um, and help us explore how embracing uncertainty could motivate us to be more curious and to think more deeply and just learn and be better. So you'll be treated to presentations from two really incredible speakers, followed by a conversation led by our moderator, Dr. Jennifer Bussell. So Dr. Bussell is a neuroscientist and postdoctoral researcher in the laboratory of Dr. Richard Axel here at Columbia University's Zuckerman Institute. And she studies the neural circuitry underlying information seeking and curiosity in mice. And she's interested in how the value of knowledge guides behavior. Dr. Bussell received her undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago and her PhD from Rockefeller University. She's the recipient of a junior fellowship from the Simons Foundation Society of Fellows and a Women and Science Fellowship recipient. And she previously worked as management consultant advising biotechnology companies. So before I turn it over to Dr. Bussell to introduce tonight's fabulous speakers, I want to thank those of you who have already submitted questions in advance when registering for our event. And you know what, that's what makes our lectures so exciting and so dynamic is when we're able to address the questions that you all, our lovely audience have. So during that Q&A, Dr. Bussell will alternate between questions from online and in-person attendees. So if you're watching online, please look for that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Submit any questions you would like as you listen to tonight's talk. And for our in-person attendees, when it comes time to the Q&A, you'll get a chance to raise your hand to ask questions into this microphone that I'm holding right now. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our host and moderator, Dr. Jennifer Bussell. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our event tonight. We will be hearing from Dr. Lisa Sun and Dr. Jacqueline Gottlieb, two experts on learning and the brain. And tonight they bring distinct but complementary approaches from psychology and neuroscience to discuss the importance of letting the mind take risks, make mistakes and wonder. And it is truly an enormous pleasure for me to be here tonight. My own research interest 
is in how the brain treats information itself as a thing of value in the world to spark our curiosity and how we use our knowledge of what we know to guide our behavior. So I cannot wait to hear the unique perspectives our speakers bring to their work on metacognition or thinking about our own thinking. And I'm excited to see what you, our audience, would like to know and share your questions with them. In this event, we'll hear two 15-minute talks, one from each speaker, after which I will moderate a discussion in which we will include questions from you, our audience, in person and online. And if you have already submitted a question, thank you. Otherwise, for folks online, look for the Q&A button to submit your question while the talks are in progress. And for those in the in-person audience, again, you can raise your hand during the Q&A period and I can call on people to answer your questions. And please let us know if you are a teacher or a student. And if you're a student, what grade you're in. We'd love to have questions from you. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lisa Sun, who is a psychologist specializing in human learning and memory and in metacognition. Her research focuses on how accurately people know the self and on optimization of long-term retention. Dr. Sun is a professor of psychology at Barnard College at Columbia University. She received a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD from Columbia University. Her work has been published in prestigious journals, including Psychological Science, Cognitive Science and Education Psychology Review. She's received funding from the US Department of Education and the American Psychological Society for her work with elementary school aged children and was twice named a Fulbright Scholar to South Korea. Her 2019 book, The Science of Metacognition, written in Korean, has begun to raise awareness on the illusions that occur during learning and on ways in which to increase performance. Her second book, Imposter, published in 2022, also in Korean, describes imposterism, a prevalent metacognitive bias that threatens the well-being of all individuals, including those who have achieved success. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sun to the stage. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? If the mic is on, it's working. I turned it on. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and it's very exciting. I've always been past this building many times but never actually came inside this building. Um, and I'm right down the street. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today is give a short introduction on metacognition, um, but then I'm also gonna talk a little bit about masks which I believe is the biggest disruptor for metacognition. So I'll start with a little task. Imagine that you're given these four pictures randomly, and I'm gonna ask you to put them in the right order. If you get it right, you get rewarded. If you get it wrong, you get a punishment. What will you do? You're probably thinking, well, I have no idea. I don't know what to do because I don't know what the right order is, right? So you might be saying to yourself, well, I need some help. I need a hint. This is actually what we did for monkeys, rhesus macaque mon monkeys many years ago. We gave them these pictures, the series of pictures, and they had to figure out A, B, C, D, E. What's the right order? If they didn't know, they could actually press this gray button, which was the I need a hint button. And what we found, was that the proportion of time the monkeys pressed the hint button was higher when it was a new list than when it was an old list. That is, they actually knew when they needed help. Okay, so now a different example. Exactly two weeks ago, this happened to me and it was bad. I knew right away that I needed a big many hints. So what I did was in within a minute, I had talked to my insurance company, a gas station and my husband. Okay, basically in that moment, the number of times I reached out was huge. Okay, so not only rhesus macaque monkeys, but actually humans, we as humans, we are information seekers. Okay, but I also wanna say that we don't just information seek in any random way. For example, at this time, two weeks ago, I was with my daughter in the car. I didn't ask her to change the tire. I didn't try taking the tire off myself because I knew I didn't know how to. And I also didn't abandon the car, go running down the street for help. Basically, right, we have a skilled approach to curiosity, okay? And if I were going kind of Jeopardy style, 
What's the question to this answer? I think it is, what is metacognition? So what are the scientific frameworks of metacognition? There are different definitions that people have given, and I'm gonna talk about three today. Self-reflection, monitoring and control, and mental time travel. Basically, the, the kind of overview of metacognition people have introduced is that it's a reflection of the self. And it comes from the Oracle at Delphi, the know thyself type of phrase, right? And I actually like this picture, which is a neuron looking at itself in the mirror. So I like to think of it as imagine this neuron looks at itself and says, you know what, my hair doesn't look right. This is a type of monitoring where you're making an assessment of what you are or what you know. Then what could that neuron do? It could say smartly, well, where's that brush? Let me brush my hair. This is the second component of metacognition in the scientific framework. Basically, we're able to make an assessment, we're able to monitor, and given that assessment, we can pick a behavior that will be appropriate for filling the gap that we have. Okay, and it works the same way with other cognitive processes. Basically, if I see a gap in my knowledge, right, I'm going to seek information that's appropriate that would fill that gap. Okay, and this monitoring and control these two components actually work with each other basically every moment. It could be ongoing, especially when you're learning something, when you're studying for an exam, for example, right? Monitoring will affect your control and control will then affect how you monitor again. So the third one that I'm gonna talk about mostly today, the third definition is mental time travel. So one of the things where we talk about metacognition is that it's mostly been looked at in the research during study, for example, for an exam. And I could say, you know, will I remember the exam, the information that I'm studying now on the exam next week? But given that most people procrastinate, we typically ask ourselves this question, even if I know the knowledge now, will I remember this tomorrow? That's the monitoring event. And if so, right? How am I going to study differently? If not, how am I going to study differently? So this monitoring and control process might be carried out in the present, but often we have to kind of go into the future, mentally time travel to think about how cognition might change in the future because cognition is not fixed, okay? And in, and in order to have good metacognition, we need to sort of include and assess the entire learning process or the cognitive process. The other thing I think that's really interesting is that even though we make predictions and kind of judgments about what will happen in the future, how do we when it's uncertain, right? The future hasn't happened yet. One of the things we can do, and one of the things I think about what do I do when I'm trying to make a prediction about the future, I go into the past. Another mental time traveling process, right? I go into the past and I'll think, Okay, well, if I studied it this way, what happened? Um, you know, and sometimes what I have here is a straight line kind of that indicates learning. It often doesn't look like this. It often looks more like this, right? If I actually go into my real past, I will remember a lot of errors and detours and kind of, oh, kind of effortful stress even. I might remember that. Right. And if I were to remember that, it might help me think, well, I can expect that again now. Right. And then the uncertainty won't be so daunting. Right. It won't be so overwhelming. Okay. This mental time travel phrase I actually got from Tolving many years ago, um, who said, a normal, healthy person who possesses autonoetic consciousness is capable of becoming aware of her own past as well as her own future. She is capable of mental time travel, roaming at will over what has happened as readily as over what might happen independently of physical laws that govern the universe. But how accurate are we at monitoring our own past, really? There is something called hindsight bias. This is a huge fallacy, and I think a very stubborn one in the cognitive field. It says that once we know the outcome, we tend to believe that we had predicted that outcome, or once we had learned something, we tend to believe that we had always known that something, right? It was also called type of creeping determinism, and it's been found in a lot of different scenarios, including medical diagnoses, legal evaluations, election results, and sporting events. And I just remember one minor time 
when AlphaGo, the machine, played the game of Go against the human champion at the time, Sedol Lee. Before the first game, I actually said to a friend, well, you know, Go is so complicated. There's no way the machine will win. Sedol Lee, the human, is going to win. After the first game, what happened? AlphaGo wins. And then I said to the same friend, you know what? AI is so advanced. <laughs> of course, you know, Sedo Lee, the human, didn't have a chance. This is a type of hindsight bias. But when I try to think about what went wrong, what went wrong in my brain, I actually think it's that I refuse to believe the past curiosity phase, the information that I had accumulated to make the judgment that the machine couldn't win at first was completely forgotten. And I changed my past thinking I had known it all along. And that's what hindsight bias has also been dubbed, the I knew it all along effect. Perhaps even more insidious is that I don't think it's that we know that we knew it all along. Rather, I think that we think we knew it slightly faster. That is, we realized that learning takes time and effort, but still we'd rather be sort of a natural. Here's an example um, of an experiment we did a few years ago where I gave people increasingly clearer pictures and asked people, what is it? Okay, eventually they'll you know, be able to identify it and they'll say bird, okay? Then we gave them the same series again and said, did you know it here, yes or no? Did you know it here, yes or no? And at some point they'll say, yes, I knew it here. They didn't say they knew it on picture one. That would be the I knew it all along effect, right? But they said I knew it here just slightly earlier than when they actually had identified it. I think that this slight discrepancy is a very thin mask. That's the insidious part of hindsight bias. It allows us to say, you know, it wasn't too bad. It was like 30 minutes when it was actually an hour. Oh, it took me a few weeks when it was actually a few months, right? And, you know, it didn't take that long. It could also be really bad once you found Waldo, right? And you give it to your friend and you say, well, it should take you two minutes. When it actually took you 10 minutes, right? This, this starts kind of this uh, culture of impatience. Right, and I've seen, I've seen it in children, I've seen it in students, and I've seen it in myself, okay? So again, Jeopardy style, who what's the question? One who wears a thin mask, who is an imposter? And here's what I think an imposter is. Um, imp in, an imposter has several different definitions, but I wanna focus on what I think is imposter with a certain type of hindsight bias. It's also one who diminishes curiosity diminishes the kind of time and effort and errors that you had gone through. I also think it's one who avoids being found out. So Sheryl Sandberg talked about this imposterism and mostly in kind of women and successful women in her book, where she said that they feel like frauds, even though they have all these accomplishments, right? They're worried that they're gonna be found out for who they really are imposters with limited skills or abilities. And originally it was Clance and Imes in the 70s who came up with this term, imposterism, to describe this feeling that somehow you weren't good enough to be where you are, okay? This is a really classic phrase that, you know, a quote that everybody uses with imposterism. It's Maya Angelou's quote where she says, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody and they're going to find me out. What is it that people will find out? Is it that we all can see her books? Is it that we can't see the effort that was put in? The information seeking phase, right? The curiosity phase, maybe the mistakes, the stress, the new copies, the drafts, right? Is that what she's worried about people finding out, right? And that's what I think of imposterism. And I've certainly felt it myself, right? Um, in the literature, we've also found out that it's not only women who are successful, it's all kinds of people, men, novices, people of all races and ethnicities, children even as young as middle school 
display this type of imposterism, variety of fields and different cultures. So this genius imposter, when I say genius imposter, I really mean that slight insidious natural, right? That slight mask that people wear, right? If I were to ask people this type of question, I can give the impression that I'm more competent than I really am on a scale of one to five. What would you say? I would actually give it a five. How about sometimes I'm afraid others will discover how much knowledge or ability I really lack. I might also be a five. Sometimes I feel or believe that my success in my life or my job has been the result of some kind of error. Same. These are all three particular items off the clan's imposterism scale. That's quite old. And now there are a few other imposterism scales, but in general, they have very similar types of items. And when I look at all of the items from the clan's imposterism scale, I sort of did my own categorization. I've taken this test so often. <laughs> And what I felt is that there are five different qualities that I think imposters feel. It's an anxiety about being found out. It's a fear of being judged. It's the need to be perfect. It's the fear of making mistakes. And ironically, it's the fear of success or acknowledgement because once you succeed, you better continue to succeed. And that's hard and that's scary, right? But here's really the, the problem. The problem is, what happens if you feel this way? You have to work alone. You can't get help. You can't take risks. You might miss out on feedback, and you will pass on rewards. But what are these types of activities? These behaviors are actually metacognitive control strategies, especially in the social context, right? If I know that I'm uncertain or need help, I should be able to ask for help. But if I'm too busy hiding, right, not trying to show my failures, I won't be asking for help, okay? When your metacognitive monitor says, I'm uncertain, there's a gap, there are a bunch of good control strategies, such as some of these, right? Can you repeat that? I didn't understand what you said. I need more time. I could use a break. Could you give me a hint? I disagree. I deserve higher pay. But the problem is, right, typically metacognitive control strategies, right, these extend the period of curiosity. It also reveals imperfection or failure, like being found out, especially for an imposter. And I just think of this one example. If I went to my boss or imagine going to my boss and said, you know what, I deserve higher pay, what might happen? It might be that they're willing to consider it which is a good thing, but they might also say to me, all right, Lisa, what's so good about what you've done this past year? It opens up a can of worms. And the can of worms is effort. Could be errors. It could be stress. It could be that I'm not a natural that people might think. And I think, what can we do about it? We're gonna talk more about this, I think, in the discussion, but I think it's up to the adults in the room parents, teachers, CEOs, to first take off the genius mask and to exhibit good metacognition, to say things like, actually, it took me a while to learn this. I had a lot of guidance. I could give you feedback on a draft. I needed it. Or you could explain it to me. Let's brainstorm together. We all need a break sometimes. Oh, you know what? I'm not so sure myself. Whenever I hear someone saying this to me, who's at a kind of higher level or status than me, it really puts me at ease. It's kind of like, you know, they're role modeling metacognitive control, which I think is equivalent to role modeling curiosity. So finally, as the adult, remembering past detours, really time traveling mentally, or taking off that thin mask is a way I think to foster metacognitive cultures. And it starts with being aware of our own curiosity and I think it ends with information seeking in front of others, taking that effort, making those errors in front of others. Once that happens, I think this irrational discomfort that's associated with uncertainty is sure to dissipate. And also, I just wanna end by saying, I don't think all masks are bad. I only think the imposter masks are bad. Once we get rid of the imposter mask, all we'll be left with are the fun ones that we don't have to be hiding. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Son. Uh, remember, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat Q&A and we will get to them after our next talk. Um, and it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Gottlieb, who is a neuroscientist studying what happens in the brain when our minds have the freedom to be curious and explore. How we orient our attention is a complex process in the brain with consequences for not just how we find answers, but how we ask questions. Dr. Gottlieb is a professor of neuroscience in the Kavli Institute for Brain Science and the Mortimer B. Zuckerman Institute for Mind, Brain, and Behavior at Columbia. After obtaining an undergraduate degree at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Gottlieb completed her PhD at Yale University and postdoctoral training at the National Institutes of Health, and she joined the Columbia faculty in 2001. Professor Gottlieb is the recipient of numerous awards, including the McKnight Scholarship, the Klinkenstein Fellowship, and Human Frontiers Research Grants. She's a pioneer in the study of neural mechanisms of attention control, active information sampling, and curiosity in humans and non-human primates. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gottlieb to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Bussell, for this kind introduction. So can you hear me? Great. Okay, so following up on Dr. San's talk, my message that I want to leave you with today is that metacognition is not only something that we do on special occasions, like maybe when we lie on a beach and can self-reflect or when we buy a self-help book or even when we can verbalize how we feel about ourselves. Instead, metacognition is very, very deeply woven into all the operations of the brain. So these processes of monitoring and control that Dr. Son spoke about, they might quiet down a little bit when we're sleeping, but they turn on the moment we become awake. And every waking moment, every second, every fraction of a second, the brain monitors its own state and makes decisions how to allocate its resources, what to do with its computational power. And this involves some mechanisms that are conscious and can be spoken about, like Dr. Son uh, said, but also many mechanisms that are unconscious, and we're only starting to reveal their neural substrates in the brain. So I will talk about some of them in this lecture. So to illustrate what I mean, I'd like us to start by watching this video. So it's a short one, one minute or so video. So let's just watch it together. Okay, see if I can turn it on. <laughs> okay, well, great, I'm glad. Okay, so some of you might have seen some of these videos, they're called change blindness or change detection videos. So I'm obviously, you didn't see this one, um, but to convince you that there are no big tricks going on here, let's look at it again, now that you know what's happening, okay? So here, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the carpet? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm glad I'm glad I got to with that one. Okay. <laughs> 
so what is the point? I mean, it really is, and there no, there's no trick. This is real. This is very real, right? There are no tricks. So it's something very deep that these, um, this experiment tells us about ourselves. We feel that we see everything. We encounter these very complex environments all the time. And we feel like all the information is just there and we take it all in, right? And the reality is that these, the world we live in is very, very big and very complicated. And our brains, as wonderful as they are, they're very small compared to the world. Right? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so every organism faces this dilemma. It's really an existential dilemma. And every organism, starting from a little amoeba to a mouse to a human to an artificial robot, faces this dilemma of how to cope with massive amounts of information. And every organism therefore requires this cognitive faculty that we usually call selective attention. That is the ability to pick only very few things from the environment and just somehow construct the reality based on that sparse information. And in humans, this process is expressed very beautifully in the way we move our eyes. So of course, when we look at a complex scene, we look at a piece of it, and then we might shift gaze and look at another piece, and then we look at another piece. So our eye movements are beautiful windows into how sparsely we, how we get a bit of information from our environment. So in my laboratory, we think about this process of attention as an act of mini curiosity. So what do I mean by this? The fact that you look at a particular spot means that you have asked the question, you have some uncertainty. So you're saying, what is there? What's that? What color is that? And you take an action to control your mental resources, in this case, your visual system, to get the, an answer and reduce the uncertainty. Aha, now I know what that is, right? So every shift of attention we think of as a question and answer. Now, again, this is unconscious, this is fast, it's not verbalizable, but if you think of it in computational terms, what the brain must do in order to do this, it's very similar to what Dr. San spoke about how the processing you have to do in order to ask a question, a verbal question. Okay, so this has, uh, this has a, a, a great advantage because the visual system, in particular eye movement systems, has been well studied in terms of neural mechanisms. And so it provides a great platform for us, for me as a neuroscientist, to get to these bigger questions. How is vision controlled in order to, in order to do this um, efficient interrogation strategy and get information efficient. And so we know, we have known for a long time that eye movements are controlled by several areas in the neocortex, that's the outer mantle of the brain. One area that's very important is the parietal cortex. There are others in the frontal cortex. And this, these areas tell us they, they sort of give, they tell us where the attentional locus is. So they have a map of a visual scene and they say, okay, now you, you select this object and then this object and then that object. But what we have been interested in is in the higher order machinery that computes and gets, identifies which object to select moment by moment. And in recent work, we have identified two major processes in, in that higher order machinery one that has to do with previous knowledge and the other that has to do with motivation. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of them. So let's talk first about knowledge. So when we think about uncertainty, we have this notion that asking a question means that we don't know anything. And in fact, that's not true. When we ask that question, it means that we have partial knowledge. It means that we know something but we're missing a little bit. And there are many ways to show this, but one really my popular way is through something that we call a trivia task. So if you came to my lab and performed a trivia task, you would get a number of questions. For example, in which US city is the public transit system known as RTA? Who wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? What day comes after Monday? And for every question, I would ask you to rate how confident you are in knowing the answer. 
and also how curious you are to get the answer and find out. And when I plot these ratings against each other, I get something that looks like this. I get an inverse relationship. And this makes perfect sense, right? So here at this end where we have high confidence, a simple question like what day comes after Monday? Well, of course I know this, I have very high confidence and I'm not curious about getting the answer. Why, why would I be? On the other hand, I'll be much more curious if I have low confidence. But the interesting part is what happens here at the low end. So look at this question. In which US city is the public transit system known as RTA? If you are like me, you'd say, I have no clue. I could come up with hundreds of cities and they're each one just as likely as each other. I really don't know. And it turns out that this state of, of very low confidence actually doesn't elicit my highest curiosity. And instead, my highest curiosity will happen here, a question like this, who wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, about which I feel that I know it. I Surely, if I think hard enough, I've known this at one point in my life. And that's when I am most curious, right? So intermediate knowledge, a little bit of knowledge, is needed in order to generate a question, in order to generate hypotheses, which then define your uncertainty that you want to resolve, right? Okay, so um, a, a, a wonderful graduate student in my lab, Michael Hampur, did a study in which he, he looked at this relation between knowledge and confidence. And in particular, he studied knowledge about images and he's presented people with blurry images that were more or less recognizable. And we know that these images, when you image the brain with, um, with a technique called, known as fMRI, the images elicit a representation in this part of the brain, the temporal visual cortex. And Mike showed that, that the way in which that visual knowledge is represented or already contains in it some information about uncertainty. So if the image is blurry, it elicits a diffuse pattern of activation that spreads across a large portion of the, uh, of, of the visual cortex. If the image is more recognizable, it elicits a more focused pattern of activation. So it, it, it excites a few neurons that really tell you about the identity of that image. And then Mike showed that this pattern of activity is sort of monitored and read out by an area in the frontal cortex that's called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex that sort of summarizes. And, and it, that provides a simpler signal that says, okay, my now the visual cortex is giving me an uncertain kind of mush or the visual cortex is giving me a clear person. And that is what gets translated into your subjective feeling that you can then report as confidence. Okay, so, um, so Mike really nailed some of the basics of, the, of, of how the, our representation of knowledge uh, gets, uh, gets read out in terms of how certain or uncertain it is and how confident or unconfident I am about it. All right, confidence is very important, but it is not sufficient because after all, we have a lot of knowledge we have a lot of things that we are uncertain about and we cannot investigate all of them. So we have to have a motive to investigate something, to, you know, to invest resources in it, to ask a question and to seek information about it. And in, 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 a, in another series of studies, um, um, we found, we, uh, we showed that um, a, a lot of motivation for information seeking is generated by a circuit that involves another frontal area that we call the anterior cingulate cortex, which lies here in the midline of the brain, uh, which works, sorry, which works together with neurotransmitters that, uh, and particularly dopamine and norepinephrine. So the anterior cingulate cortex receives inputs from the, a small nucleus in the brain that releases dopamine, and we all know that dopamine signals reward values, and the anterior cingulate cortex monitors the rate of rewards that we obtain in a particular situation or in a task. And in particular, this area is sensitive to a decline in the rate of reward, which tells it that we might, need, we might have a need for control. In other words, your performance is getting a bit worse, you're not getting that many rewards, you want to do better. 
And when the, uh, this area detects a need for control, it, um, it calls on this other nucleus in the brainstem that we call the locus ceruleus to release norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a, produces arousal and it gets distributed throughout the brain, in, including in this area in the parietal cortex, uh, right here, uh, which has visual maps that I told you then guide the orienting, select visual stimuli. And this release of norepinephrine then induces your attentional system to focus more narrowly on the relevant stimuli. Okay, so this circuit, uh, the ACC together with dopamine and norepinephrine, in fact computes what we call, what an economist would call a cost benefit trade off. So by monitoring dopamine, it knows how rewarding it, how many, how much benefits you will get from focusing on something. And then releasing nor norepinephrine it pays a cost, right? So improving your processing is an energetic cost. And, and this is probably what we feel as cognitive effort. So basically this anterior cingulate cortex said, it's worth it to you to pay this cognitive cost in order to obtain higher reward, some benefit. Okay, so I took you through a very fast tour through the main processes that are um, involved in, in this uh, attentional questioning. And to end, I want to speak a little bit about this question of benefits, right? So you, you've all heard about dopamine and we all know that dopamine is the reward um, and motivation um, signal in the brain. And mostly neuroscientists have um, studied dopamine using physical rewards like, like um, food or water for animals or money for people. Uh, but here, um, as, as Dr. Bussell said in the beginning, we are thinking about something more interesting and higher order. We're thinking about the benefit that comes from getting information, the value of information. So what is that? Recent results show that dopamine neurons also encode the value of information. And in our field, we start to think about the value of information of being of two kinds that we call instrumental and non-instrumental. Instrumental information, the instrumental value comes about when we use the information to achieve another goal. So for example, if I walk on the street in Manhattan, I come to an intersection, I look at the traffic light before crossing the street. Now it isn't that I'm really interested in what's the color of that traffic light. The traffic light is simply a means to obtain my goal, which is to get to the other side. On the other hand, if I, at, at another moment of walking down the street, I may look out at a cloud and really become interested in the shape of the cloud and the movement of that cloud. Now I cannot use that particular information to, to do, I cannot do much based on it, but I am curious about it. There's some good feeling or some, something internal, some mental state that I value when I engage with that, uh, with that particular information. So here information is a goal in itself. And this is of course, uh, what, what fuels things like curiosity and intrinsic motivation. And this particular kind of um, intrins it, this intrinsic motivation is really a fairly new topic in our field is very intriguing. And um, I don't have a lot of time um, to talk about it, but we can, we can speak uh, a little more in the discussion. Okay, so I'm being told that I have to end. So, um, um, so, so I, I spoke about this mini curiosities that every shift of attention is, a, is an expression of our curiosity. And really this, this mechanism is our main tool for investigating and knowing anything about the world. We don't know anything about the world unless we ask. Um, and this is a, a and and we are learning something about the mechanisms with the, which depend on previous knowledge, external rewards, and intrinsic motivation. And just to end, I want to again emphasize this fact that because it's a mechanism for dealing with complexity, um, the the question of how we control attention and how we ask these questions is relevant across the board to a very wide domain. Of, of investigation. So one is for complex decisions that individuals do, like how does a pilot uh, control a plane? How do students learn in a classroom? But it's also very relevant to societal decision. 
How does information get propagated in society? How does it get communicated? How does it get selected, right? We have societal attention to various things. How does it get selected based on goals and so on? And it's also extremely important for artificial intelligence these days, particularly for the goal of creating autonomous agent. If you want to make any, any agent that acts um, freely in a realistic world, you have to solve this question of how does it pick information? How does it select information uh, without exhausting its resources uh, too quickly? Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Gottlieb for your lovely talk. And I'd like to invite Dr. Sun up and now I think we'll take some questions from our audiences. Those were both just really fantastic. And I'm, I'm excited to, to talk with both of you. Um, I guess I'll start first with a question that I had. And that's, it seems that, you know, both of your work and your approaches deal with uncertainty. And both, you know, our uncertainty about the external world and our uncertainty within ourselves about our own knowledge and abilities. And so then the question is, if you would talk a little bit about the balance between being overwhelmed by uncertainty or even underwhelmed by it, such that you're uninterested versus being inspired by uncertainty to be curious and to seek information. So, yeah, uh, thank you for this question. Um, uh, yeah, I, I read this question. I was thinking about, oh, what, when am I overwhelmed? with uncertainty? When do I feel uncomfortable? And the thing that kept coming up, it's, it's kind of a boring answer and a bad answer. It is when I don't go after that uncertainty at the time. It's when I procrastinate, when I'm lazy. And then what happens is when I realize, oh, there's too much to learn in a, in a too short a time space, it's too late. I don't want to learn anything because I'm so stressed about how to get the information I need. So I've actually, over these past few years, I mean, I've worked on metacognition now for a long time, and I realize how bad I've been at it. But just in the past few years, especially thinking about imposterism, I've changed it to make it more conscious about when I want to know something now. When I wanna learn something, research something, when I wanna read a particular article, I do it now, even if it's for like five minutes, because then I've started it and this kind of information seeking that if it's balanced in the sense of time for me, then I, I don't have that overwhelming stress as much as I used to when I would procrastinate and think, oh, I don't wanna know how much I don't know. Right. That I think that's where what gets you into that really difficult spiral of I'm gonna leave everything and never get it done. Yeah. Right. But yeah. it might be a very different answer from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean I think we will always give the same answer at different levels of abstraction. So one really important thing to realize is that um we are not really made to um know everything, to resolve all uncertainty, or even to evaluate uncertainty in the abstract. So I think that what our, brain do, what our brains do, they, they, always, they, they always have this tight relationship between uncertainty and value, and value comes from the ability to resolve it. So in other words, if it's a question that I can do something about, and maybe I think different individuals are maybe differ in, in this sense. So, so, so here's a question and I could decide what, I could decide immediately, this is too complicated for me. I'm not gonna bother about it. Or I'm gonna decide, oh, this is something that I can actually tackle. So I have 10 minutes, I can do this right now. So it, it, I feel at least subjectively that at that point that, <laughs> that it, anxiety may arise if, there is an uncertainty and you sort of engage it, but you don't feel like you have a plan for resolving it, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, or if yeah. you do, or, but you're an imposter. Or if you so do, you and you're an imposter, right. Reach out in the right. way that's available 
where you can right. get the right information you need, right. which I think I've, I've, I'm the biggest imposter. I've been the one that's, you know, said to myself, I know I need more information, but let me just be quiet. I can figure it out on my own later because right. I don't want to burden others or right. I don't want it to be found out that I don't know it all. Right. Right. And I, that's been a barrier, I think. Yeah, that's right. And then it gets overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we have many questions submitted online on a sort of common theme, which is how do we use this, right? Like how do we use metacognitive strategies to help with our learning and how do we put ourselves in a state of curiosity where, where we're interested in re and ready to learn and seek information? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I think this is also related to another question that I really liked. Someone just asked very simply, is curiosity genetic? <laughs> and and I, that was when, next I on my list. when I first <laughs> saw that question, I was like, yeah, it is, as in terms of, in, in, in the sense of all humans have it, <laughs> right? It's not like, a, I don't think of it as a, you know, some people are more curious than others. I think it's such a basic human quality that we're all born with, that it's already in us, first of all. I mean, it was in the monkeys, right? <laughs> the monkeys know, and they're very not human. Even, no matter how close they are to us, right? So thinking in that sense, you know, we we all have this quality to be curious and need more information. And that turns into a, a very basic metacognitive skill that we learn from, you know, there's metacognitive research on young toddlers, you know, kindergartners, first graders, elementary school students, and while the metacognitive process isn't perfect, right? Because we actually learn metacognition by making errors in metacognition too, right? But we still have this, um, you know, just knowing that we already have the ability is, is good enough. And going, just to put in the imposterism again, one of the things that I found when I talk to children, especially, you know, since I've written this book in Korea, I talked a lot to Korean children and their parents. And what I see is that when children are curious about something, parents often, or even teachers will either give the answer directly and say, that's the answer, which is cutting off the curiosity or cutting off that metacognitive control and so it's sort of like, we, I think we have this skill naturally, but given our culture and how all adults are imposters, we're cutting this off in children. And I think it makes it more difficult to stay curious as we get older, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So to the, to the question is, is curiosity genetic? I mean, I, I would go a step further because I would say every, again, if you think about attention, every organism, you, you need this curiosity to survive, right? This is how you navigate your world by asking these questions. So that's a very, obviously when, when you make an eye movement, you don't think of it as a question, but I think it's a building block that really evolved from the simplest organisms. And then in humans, we build on it and we elaborate on it with very complex knowledge and with language and so on. And so I think of it in, ter if, in terms of the value of information. So remember when, when you ask a question, you are asking for something and you are asking for information, right? And so how do you decide to ask for information? It's a similar process to how do you decide, you know, to ask for an ice cream? How do you decide to ask for an ice cream? Well, you remember what an ice cream feels like. You, you compare, you might have some internal state where you're, something in your body says, I need sugar. And then you remember what the ice cream tastes like. And that's what makes you decide to ask for the ice cream. So I think asking for information is very similar. You detect some uncertainty and then you have an estimate of what might it be like when I get the information. What would it be like when I read this book? What will you be like when I watch this movie? And you prospect. 
And what, what you, you prospect, you expect to be in a certain state. And what you expect is a certain feeling, like a em whole emotional state that you have in your head. And you make a decision, either I like to be in that brain state or I don't like to, I don't want to think about this. And we know there's also, there are also phenomena of information avoidance. Uh, I don't want to think about this. And, and so, and, and I think that these higher order, uh, evaluating those expected mental states um, well, the states have many dimensions, right? You can like or dislike them for many different reasons. And I think that there's a lot of learning um, involved in there. And a lot of it depends on, again, how did you feel when you asked the last question, right? I mean, if you have a teacher that scowls at you or makes you feel stupid, you're going to remember that. And you're going to think, oh, if I ask this question, it's not going to be so good. So you're not going to ask that question, right? Or if you had your own self-monitoring of the effort you make. If you try to solve a math question and it felt so bad, it felt so hard, you were so tired, you couldn't do it, it was extremely frustrating. Again, you're gonna anticipate an unpleasant mental state when you encounter the next question, and so you won't ask it. And so I think that learning to be curious and to kind of put a positive spin on learning, I think that um, learning to like learning, I think that's definitely a thing. And I think that it can be trained and supported in many different ways. Yeah, so it, yeah. to follow yeah. up on that, I totally agree. And, um, you know, I'm just remembering one time, you know, this, this question of giving the, you know, giving the information a child wants or a student wants, how do you give them the information that will give rise to more curiosity rather yes. than here's the answer, just memorize it, yeah. right? That's the worst thing, right? And I remember when my, um, when my daughter was, um, I think she was like five or something and she made her phone call uh, to her cousin in Korea. And I was like, well, no, she's not gonna be awake yet because it's night there. And it was like, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean it's night there when it's morning here? Like she didn't know, you know, so, but I did, I'm not going to give her the answer right. about how the world works and how night and day works, you know, but so I just told her, well, I don't know, what's the shape of the earth, you think? <laughs> and she was like, and then she would think about that for days and days. And then eventually she figured it out with just small hints. Right. So I think that like with the monkeys, this rather than give me the answer give me a hint right. mm -hmm. is, is really a good way of uh, training curiosity, I think. Mm -hmm. So let's take a question from the audience here. You had your hand up first, I guess. <laughs> um, hello? Okay. Uh, thank you. This is amazing, by the way. Um, from Dr. Sun's lecture, you mentioned for the CIS things like fear of being judged, needing to be perfect, fear of making mistakes. I teach at an all-girls school, and these are a lot of things that I see, especially in my math classroom. Um, and one of your strategies says modeling as adults, but you also mentioned a lot of our adults are having the same issues with being imposters and needing to take out that genius mess themselves. Are there other strategies you'd recommend for us helping our students in the classroom to hopefully help out our next generation and ourselves? So, yeah, I think this is this is the one of the most difficult questions and just how to apply it even in my own life as a teacher, right? When I when I talk with my students or even when I'm lecturing with students, we're, you know, there, there's some research which is interesting. The more expert we are, the more imposteristic we feel. It's sort of like, you know, when I first became a professor, I thought I had to be perfect because I had to prove to everyone that I was worth that you know, being a professor, and but it, it made me more and more anxious, right? So when I first started teaching, you know, I was that typical imposter where if a student asked me a question I didn't know, you know, I'd be very quick to be like, well, maybe, you know, I'll figure it out later, let's talk after class, right? To kind of divert. And that's the worst strategy, but you see it everywhere. And, you know, other things that I see that I try not to do, um, are, I think, the strategies to take off this mask. 
For example, now, if a student asks me something that I really don't know, the first thing I'll say is, you know, that's really interesting and I would love to find out more. Like, let's find out more together. And I, that's just really kind of comforting for the students. Um, and I just, you know, it, it's really, they're looking to me to be the role model about curiosity and about making errors and being not perfect. And I think that we just have to keep doing that. Um, I, I think it's really difficult. And I think we're really, again, like deceptive because sometimes we'll, we'll pretend, like I'll pretend I've taken off the mask. I'll, but instead of saying, you know, oh, you know, I really don't know, but let's think about and brainstorm it. If I'm too nervous to take off my mask, I might say that, then immediately follow up with, uh, does anyone else know? Again, the diversion, right? And I feel like even for myself, I have to stop doing that, right? To make sure that the, the, the whole culture changes. Um, and also telling everyone that everyone's an imposter, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're all an imposter. Yeah. And it's really sad because whenever I do this impost these imposter studies with Columbia students, I can't get good data because everyone's an imposter. <laughs> I'm trying to compare the lower imposterism score people with the higher, but I'm getting so few low imposteristic kind of scores that, you know, in the past few years, and it's very difficult that a lot of people feel this way because they feel like they have to be the sort of genius that got accepted at, at a really nice university. Right. Okay. So just in response, super quickly, we're all teachers. Well, most of us are teachers. And I had, an, uh, I had an instance, literally yesterday, I'm a special ed math teacher. A sub came in to cover my co-teacher. And I pride myself on knowing like what's going on all the time and like being able to answer the kids' questions. The sub came in and I was doing something and I guess I made a mistake. The sub comes comes over to me and he's like, this is the answer. And I'm like, no, like <laughs> I've put the answer up. We're done. We're moving on. That's it. And he's like, no, no, no. Here's the answer. And like, I, in that moment, what I should have done is like looked over what he said and like looked over his work and been like, although to be fair, subs are from the land of Narnia. We have no idea. <laughs> I should have looked over his work and then been like, okay, you know, either yes, I agree or no, I don't just, you know, whatever. And like taken the, the onus of like, maybe I made a mistake. Yeah. I didn't. Today, I also did not. I should have. <laughs> so I did make a mistake. Um, Monday I will. Um, but that was not my question. That was just like to say, like, it is really hard in the moment, especially when you feel like you're held up to the standard, whether you put the standard on yourself or it's put upon you of like, I know everything. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, I had some questions about the highlight bias. Oh, I'm sorry, hindsight bias. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like a two part. Do you think possibly, I know you said that it's like it has to do kind of with like you wanting to say that you know it earlier than you do, but could it also just be like you're embarrassed that you didn't know it sooner? Yeah, actually, you know? if you look at the literature, it's it's really complicated, but there's different mechanisms for why it occurs. Some say, yeah, it's kind of like you want to be like a genius and, and you're sort of embarrassed. But the other is that we actually can't go back in time because it's not there anymore. Once you've updated your memories to that mm -hmm. full outcome, the full final picture, when you go back, it's kind of like it's so blurred, you know, and distorted that there's nothing to really go back to. Right. Okay. So actually the hindsight bias, I did this review a few years ago with like every single de-biasing paper. Okay. And it was like, I think 85% of the studies were failed at debiasing and they tried all kinds of things. The only thing that sort of works is if you ask children or kids or students to um, 
give list reasons of the opposing outcome, the opposite outcome that you, you know, that instead of what you expect, list the opposite, kind of contradict yourself, contradict yourself, then you're better at realizing, oh, it could have been both ways. And that's what I had thought originally. Mm. But that doesn't even work all the time. Okay. Yeah. It's really difficult, I think, to get rid of this hindsight, hindsight bias. Um, and so I just tell myself all the time, especially bringing up kids, it's like, oh, how was I then? And then I realized, oh my gosh, I was really stupid. Sure. Right? <laughs> but, but if we don't but, do that time travel, it's kind of like, oh, well, but, I know everything. Right? right. But but in general, our brain has a huge bias to be aware of what it sees and not be aware of what it doesn't see, right? So I, I showed you that video, which is like incredibly striking. You look at things and you don't see them. Also, visually, just to, to break some other news, um, in the visual <laughs> periphery, you, you're legally bl blind, right? So if you're looking at me right now, you practically don't see anything in the visual, in, in the per periphery outside of your center of gaze. Um, you, you're not aware of that. You would never say that, right? Because your brain and also that demonstration, you don't, you're not going to go around in the world thinking, oh, I don't see anything. I don't see anything, right? <laughs> because we are made that way to be aware of what we have, the information we have. And, and all those uncertainties that are there and our brain monitors them, that monitoring is really fleeting. I mean, it, it's, in, and it's a lot of it is unconscious because otherwise you couldn't function. So, in, you know, in a sense, you have to be overconfident to, to act mm -hmm. in the world. And the, the second yeah. part is, is there yeah. any way that the hindsight bias is caused by anxiety? Like, you know, like you're anxious about like yeah. having the correct answer or whatever the case may be. And yeah. that causes you to kind of overcompensate perhaps? I think I definitely think it could be. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. One thing that I, I think I mentioned this before when we were preparing for this, one thing that I hate that teachers do, and I've even seen it now with my kids' teachers, is I'll say to my daughter when she got something wrong on an exam, I'll say, you know, or she, or she disagrees with it, I'll say, go ask the teacher and, you know, talk about what could have been better, right? And she immediately said to me, this was just a few months ago, she said, no, I'm not going to ask the teacher because then he's going to grade the entire thing again, he said, and he might find something else wrong and take off different points. <laughs> this use of threat, threats of persuade, you know, yeah. these kinds of threats, right, that cuts off all, all curiosity, all learning, all, you know, we're not, what are we doing if they can't even ask about the error, right? That That's a huge problem and I see that, but that's related to the anxiety that the teacher wants to be perfect as a grader and it's very annoying. It's an imposter. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Okay, so I, I don't want to do wrong by our folks on Zoom because there's a lot of them, even though we can't see them. Um, so let's let's take a question from online. We have a couple asking about, very timely, chat GPT and AI. <laughs> and I think the question is, it's just how does AI fa GPT factor in this? But I guess one of the questions could be, you know, how do you get an artificial intelligence to learn and behave in the way that we know mm. real embodied intelligences do you can start <laughs> oh, uh, yeah well you know uh, yeah i'm not sure i want that <laughs> um yeah because so actually yeah yeah yeah. it's so, all so, going to be even more impostery now that uh, gpt <laughs> is coming for our jobs maybe that's the question yes <laughs> right so i do think that this is the frontier in artificial intelligence research is knowing how to create a machine that can investigate as efficiently as humans investigate and ask questions, right? Because that's that's the that's the problem with most machine drones, self-driving cars is this information overload. They have to have an attentional mechanism, and 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 then 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 to make a real intelligent um, robot, you want to have more than just moment by moment attention. You want to have something that builds knowledge and then 
investigates based on its own knowledge and it creates its own knowledge base, right? It has this, um, which, so, so, so the study of curiosity in neuroscience is a fairly new um, topic, believe it or not. Um, um, most of most neuroscience experiments up till now have been have took this complexity out, and instead of letting you pick the information, they just give the information to you, right? Like if you come to an experiment, they put you in a dark room and they flash something big in your face, right? And then that's your whole world. That's it. I'm giving you all the information you need, and then you just press the button, right? This is. Uh, so only now we're waking up to this idea that the brain is, you know, how is this active interrogation happening? Anyway, so so we are at the beginning of this, but I think, you know, in a few decades or so, we will know a lot more. And these AI people are very curious and they they will copy it and neuroscience will copy <laughs> from AI and they will learn our tricks and we'll learn their tricks. And so who knows that we might create much more uh, powerful curious machines and then and then we have to think how we, how we control them and if we control them then they will become very uh very important chat gpt doesn't have that chat gpt is a very stupid it does a prediction <laughs> very stupid it, uh, but but it's truly impressive how how far, how much it can do was just a very basic prediction um and it, it does a little bit it has uncertainty built into it but but it's it's just a very simple form so yeah, with the yeah. chat GPT, yeah. so, you know, I was writing this thing about chat GPT and metacognition. So I, I you know, so I, I interacted with it. And the first thing I said was, hi. And it said, hello, how can I help you? And then I said, how do you feel? And it said, I'm sorry, because I'm a machine, I don't have answers to kind of emotional questions. So in that, it has right when it said that, no, <laughs> listen, right when it said that, my first kind of reaction was, ooh, it knows what it doesn't know. Yeah. Right. Is that metacognition? Right. But then I did more research. <laughs> I read about what other kinds of uh, AI researchers are thinking, like Gary Marcus and a few mm -hmm. other people. And I've been reading a lot. And Gary Marcus is very, you know, it's very stupid. Don't, we shouldn't even be having conversations with it, he says, right? <laughs> but then I continue to ask questions. Here's what the problem is. You, in order to have curiosity or metacognition, you need to have intellectual humility, which means when you say you don't know, you have to say, I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. It didn't, and it doesn't. In fact, if you right. ask it, right. would, I, would it be helpful if I told you how you felt? It said, no, I'm not, in, it, it, I can't do it. Then when I asked it, um, I asked it a question about um, uh, the weather or something and it answered the weather, it was perfect. And then I asked it, how sure are you? Talk about intellectual humility. It said, I am completely sure. <laughs> so so as long as, as long as chat GPT or other bots of its kind don't have, I mean, they might know that they don't know, but the, the real metacognition that humans have is that curiosity for learning more, for filling wanting. that gap, wanting. Desire. Yeah, it's the desire and exactly you know some things, but not others. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's yeah, so that, that is, yes. has mm -hmm. zero curiosity, yeah. <laughs> very high confidence. <laughs> and, um, and this is something Gary Marcus said. He said something about, I don't know what the conversation was, but he asked it, he told it, you are wrong. Can you give me a better answer? And it actually gave a more wronger answer, <laughs> right? If ChatGPT cannot discriminate between two choices of behavior, that's metacognition. It doesn't have metacognition because that's what we're doing all the time. Like your allocation of the visual field, it's actually choosing between different possible options. And that's what GPT lacks, right? So we're almost out of time, but let's let's end on a positive note. And with this, <laughs> this internal motivation, the wanting, right? That chat GPT doesn't have and creativity for thinking about a new interesting question and, and wanting that. And I guess maybe just talk about like, 
what do we know about where that internal motivation and drive that we have to be curious comes from? Do we know? Yeah. Oh, de but definitely I like this idea of ending on a positive note yeah. because, you know, the just kind of thinking about how much happier I've been because of knowing metacognition, knowing about self-reflection, right? Knowing that I can make decisions that might not be the best, but are going towards something that might help me have a bigger picture or an understanding of some concept I don't know. And I also, as again, as, a, as the adult, the teacher or a parent, it is, it's been the most, you know, kind of exciting thing for me, not only to look at my own curiosity, but to look at my students' curiosities, which are completely different than mine. You know, just, just the idea that curiosity is an individual, kind of a very personal kind of path in your life. That just makes me really happy because I know I'll always learn more, not only from smart students, but even from my like fourth grader or my, you know, whatever age you are, even if I meet a toddler, just seeing, oh, I, I never thought of that, right? Seeing these kinds of curious behaviors. So I just love the idea that because curiosity is related to metacognition, Metacognition has also been defined as privileged access. It means we only, we are the only ones who are, have the privilege to getting access into our own curiosities, our own minds. So that's something that's made me very happy about just knowing metacognition. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that answering your question, um, Dr. Bussell would be like understanding how the brain works <laughs> if we could answer your question. Yeah. Because I really think that knowing wh where your curiosity come from comes from, it it really is, um, it comes from, it, from who you are, really. It comes from your values. It comes from what you know, what you've learned, from what you've learned to want, from what you think is possible, from what you think you can achieve. Right. So it's really about how you have, like, if you imagine the world as being this infinite place, you're a small agent in that world and you have to find your path through it. And you find your path somehow. Now, how do you know which direction to go in? Well, we as we're instructed by our parents, right? And our parents teach us what to want. And part of what we want uh, is is uh, is is what information we're interested in to get to those goals, right? And then and then that then then we get more knowledge, and then that creates other wants and so on. And so we're finding so so we think of of curiosity as just getting one bit of information, one bit, one bit. But other people in personality psychology, they think of curiosity traits, and they have these questionnaires where. They different different individuals rate higher or lower on different forms of curiosity, and we have done some studies that try to link in the information gathering we do in the lab with personality traits, and we're finding that there there are definite links. Um, some domains, some measures of curiosity don't actually map because I think our tasks are too small, but other domains related to uncertainty, stress. Um, the ability to handle stress. Um, amazingly enough, this trait of this called extraversion uh, relates fairly strongly to some, some forms of information seeking in the lab, which is a surprise to me. There's something that's not expected, and yet it turns out to be a very consistent finding in our data. And which really brings out the point that the, this question, how do we know what to be curious about? How do we become intrinsically motivated? I think a lot of it is learned in a social context. And um, again, that's something that we're just starting to research and, and look into. Thank you so much. So that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you all for coming and attending our event. Thank you so much to our thank two you. speakers. We really appreciate it. Um, there is a survey that is going to be popped into the chat for folks who are online. So we hope that people will take 
two minutes to fill out the survey because we welcome the feedback for future events like this. And thank you all again. Thank you. <laughs>